So I want to welcome you to uh, what is, in fact, the inaugural event of a new series here at Roosevelt House called Phenomenal Women at Roosevelt House. Um, taking up, of course, Maya Angelou's uh, poem and idea that women um, are, in fact, phenomenal, that not allowing ourselves to be constrained and contained and held back and covered up makes us phenomenal. And uh, let me just t read to you what you could read for yourselves on the very back. You can keep it forever. Um, Phenomenal Women is a new series that will bring the voices, insights, and experiences of girls and women whose local, national, and global activism, creativity, scholarship, and perspective, and perspectives gain, provoke, I'm sorry, engage, provoke, and inspire innovative paths to social justice and public policy. And tonight's uh, first event, Slut the Seminar, is going to be doing just that. I think it actually ticks off a number of our boxes um, and brings our framework to life, brings voices, insights, and experiences of girls and women whose activism is especially creative, how art can, in fact, be activism, and will engage, provoke, and inspire innovative paths to social justice and public policy for you and for all of us to think about and talk about. Uh, it is called Slut the Seminar because the point of this evening is to have a conversation that will be profoundly inspired, I hope, by uh, the performance of the current cast of Slut the Play. Um, hi, everyone. So my name is Katie Cappiello, and I am the writer and director of Slut the Play. Um, and I always say this because it's true, but my, my favorite job of all my jobs is actually that I am their teacher. And um, as you can see, they're pretty spectacular. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Oh, they have mics. Never mind. I know. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Amalia. Well, say, how old you are when you get out? Oh, OK. Hi, I'm Amalia. Um, I'm 15, and I go to LaGuardia High School. I'm Nikita. I'm 17, and I go to ICE. I'm Jasmine. I'm 16, and I go to Beacon. Um, Awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, I also just want to say thanks so much to all of you for being here. Um, thanks to, I'm going to call you Deb, but OK. Thanks to Deb for hosting, and thanks to Roosevelt Health for having us. We're really excited to be here. Um, and and um, I think really moved that Roosevelt House and, and, and Hunter want to have this conversation, because I think um, it's it's important and it's essential in creating spaces like this where we can have a community conversation. Um, um, I think makes all the difference in the world. So what we're gonna do is, I, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the play, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the activism that these that these amazing young women do um, uh, all around the country, and then um, I'm gonna take your questions. So I'm letting you know so you can start brainstorming some questions you might have. Um, Deb, did you wanna ask a couple questions first or should I just go for it? Okay. Okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about um, how this play came about, why it came about, and, um, and what we're doing with it. And so uh, and I wrote this play actually in 2012. Um, and interestingly, when I was writing it, I guess I should have known um, that it would continue to be relevant um, because we are not where we want to be yet when it comes to this issue. I, I'm excited to say and proud to say that I think that art helps us get where we want to go. I have seen communities be transformed when the conversation um, is available to them. And so for us, that's, that's a part of, of, of this project. So in 2012, I was working with a group of girls. I'm a theater teacher. Um, but my goal is really to introduce young people how to fuse theater and social activism, um, social justice. So how do we take this art form that we love so much and find a way to use it to um, um, better the world, right? Or, or, or say things that no one's saying or shed light on something that is underground and festering and no one's talking about enough because we don't have the permission to talk about it. So in this group of girls that I had, um, they were eighth, ninth, and 10th graders in this group. And they were kind of like anyone who knows young people. I mean, all of you were young people at one point. Like that's a, 
it's a funky age, right? It's a very interesting age because it's when everything starts to happen. Like you're really starting to come into your sexuality. You're sometimes transferring to a new high school and that kind of creates different dynamics. You're trying to fit in. You're trying to figure out where you belong. And so many of these girls I had known um, from the time they were six, seven years old, they had been working with me. So now I'm seeing them at 13, 14, 15, 16, 7, 16. Um, and I started hearing pretty much story after story of their experiences with, yes, catcalling, yes, sexual aggression, um, but more frequent, frequently um, than I was aware um, with sexual assault. So one of the girls was being raped repeatedly by her boyfriend. Another one of the girls was sexually assaulted by her doorman um, and then had to watch as all the other tenants in the building pooled their money together to fund his defense because she was a slut and dressed in short shorts all the time. Um, another one of the girls had been at a house party and um, had uh, been making out with this boy she'd had a crush on for so long and he um, led her to a bathroom. She was so excited because she was like, oh my God, he must really like me. And then he locked the door um, and wouldn't let her out, literally physically barricaded the door until she gave him a blowjob. And so these were the types of stories that I was hearing, just story after story. And I'm sitting there thinking, this is over a third of my girls. And I don't know anywhere where this conversation is happening. I know it's not happening in their schools. I know it's not happening at their dinner tables. And it was barely even happening in my class, and I thought we were pretty radical. And so I just thought, is there a way to dramatize this? Is there a way to turn this into a piece that would create a platform for us to have, as in, in many, as many theaters in houses of worship and schools and whatever as possible, this conversation? And so it took me about a year and a half to write the script. And, um, and since then, um, a, lot of, a number of the original cast members have graduated and gone off to college um, and are now continuing this activist effort on their campuses. And these girls come up from you know, our middle school groups and our elementary school groups and they take on this play and we've toured it now all over the country. It's been um, produced and performed um, in um, Australia and all throughout Mexico and um, in Canada. And, um, and our goal really is to provide communities, whoever wants it really, with a tool. Um, it's been published by the Feminist Press, so it's out there for the world to, to license and do, and, um, and because these conversations are hard to start, and somehow theater helps us do that. The storytelling helps us do that. It gives us permission, it gives us language. So that's um, really where this play came from. And, um, and, and so, I would love to answer any questions you might have because I feel like I'm, I have a ton of information for you. But it, yes. Uh, these girls who have been assaulted and, and, it, and it is just so common. Mm -hmm. Do they report this crime? Do they go to the police? Um, so, not always. Often not, right? So, more high school students that are sexually assaulted, um, more, more do not report the crime than report the crime. And I think we are very clear why, right? I mean, this is not something that usually goes well for these girls. We went to St. Paul School recently um, in response to the brutal rape that happened there. And um, the girl who was raped said after, in the aftermath of the trial, um, she was on the stand for three straight days. Her violator was on the stand for three hours. And she said she would never do it again, ever. She would never have made that choice. If she had to go back and do it again, she would not do what she did. She would not come forward. It was too brutal. She had to leave the school. She had to move out of her community. And we see that time and time again. Same thing happened in Steubenville. Same thing happened with Daisy Coleman in Missouri, right? Like it happens across the board. Um, and so, no, a lot of times they don't. And I think it's also really important for us to think about that there are also reasons why girls, uh, um, depending on, we, we have to talk about the intersectionality of the issues. Like there are girls who don't come forward because they do not trust law enforcement. And so you've got a girl who's gonna what, like go to the cops? 
when all she's ever seen are cops torment her community? No. And then she's going to go to the cops and say some boy from her neighborhood who has already probably experienced some form of police discrimination, she's going to put that boy in the hands of these cops? No. So, so, so they don't, no. I will say that the girl, the door, the girl that I brought up, um, my student who was sexually assaulted by her doorman, did report it. It did go to trial. And members, you know, people from her building, like I said, pooled his defense and took the stand and testified against her, saying that they always saw her in these outfits. So you make it sound very hopeless. Do you see any, any way? I don't uh, mean it to, sorry. Yeah. I mean, with the Me Too movement, yeah. I would think that, that girls would be more motivated to, uh -huh. uh, uh, to be, you know, outspoken about it. Um, I'm going to let them talk to you about that. Uh, I will just say I, I don't think it's hopeless, and we can talk about that um, in a minute. Uh, I definitely do not at all. I, don't, I think that there is a way for us to address this issue that doesn't make it hopeless, which is a proactive approach, um, which I don't think we're doing enough right now. Um, but I'll let them talk about the Me Too, their, like their feelings on Me Too and how it's extending or not to girls. Um, yeah, so I think that, I mean, I've definitely been feeling a lot more hopeful with recent events just because I think that the conversation is getting a lot easier to have and I think that people are a lot more open to hearing about it. Um, but I kind of think a situation that has not improved because of the Me Too movement is just like, I don't know, there's no room for people my age, I feel like. It feels like it's kind of all about workplace discrimination. It's all about these adults who like have whole careers and like there's all these like, they have a lot of also a lot of like public standing, they're all usually celebrities, um, the ones that we hear about. And so it feels like even though I think the conversation like generally is easier to have, I think that it hasn't really trickled down yet, or I don't know if it will, um, to kids in high school, to teenagers, to teenage girls. Like we still don't have the agency to like discuss these things, especially not with people with adults. Um, so I think that even though I, I do foresee like like the conversation is now easier and I think that that will continue to get easier. I still think that like our needs aren't really being addressed at all. So that's kind of where that's at. So where, what do you think needs to be done? Besides I think, just talk. Yeah. Well, I think that the way to start everything is through conversation. And I think that this is a really great way to bring it, to have it happen because obviously now we're having this conversation. So I think that like, I think having talks in schools is really important. That's always been like kind of where I think things need to start. Um, and so I think that people who work in schools, educators need to bring things up so that they can kind of create a place where kids can talk about this stuff. And then I think once that happens, you have a bunch of kids who are willing to talk about it. They grow up, become adults who are willing to listen to younger kids. Like I think that it all starts with conversation and I think that that's not where it should stop. I think that once that happens, you have a bunch of people who are able to advocate and who are able to take changes in the law, um, but I think it really needs to begin with just having a open conversation about it. Yeah, I think young people are like essential to this, and that's maybe where the Me Too movement falls a little bit short, is like, we wouldn't be having issues in the workplace if we had taught students to behave as they should. So if we, like, obviously workplace issues are gonna be different than in school, but if you understand the basics of like, consent and respect and, you know, some of the smaller level things, th then we can work with, like, people who still don't understand it in the workplace. But if we're not, if we fix it in schools and in young people and in college, whatever, whenever, before they get to work, we don't have to have a Me Too movement for all the Harvey Weinsteins in the world. We can, like, fix the George Luke and Tims and then yeah. we don't have adult George Luke and Tims doing this to their coworkers. Do you think that pornography has affected this disrespect of uh, girls and women? Uh, because, I mean, it's always been a problem, but it's just so, so much worse, I think, for the young girls today. And I don't think young girls think they have a choice uh, in... Uh, in a lot of sexual activity. I think it's mandatory. They feel it's mandatory. And uh, and that's shocking to me, that there, there seems to be no self-respect. It seems like they go into the automatic, uh, you know, sadomasochism where they're the masochists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think pornography 100% impacts um, 
how generations grow up, and we were just talking about this before, but boys start watching pornography when they're maybe eight, and they're, since they start watching that from such a young age, they're instilled with this idea that they are the ones who deserve pleasure and that a woman should only be sexual for the pleasure of the man. Mm -hmm. And then that they, they will keep watching it, they assume that they have no place to talk about their sexuality and girls have no place to talk about their sexuality in a free and expressive way. So both, uh, so all genders feel really stuck in that, in these ideas that have been instilled in us from such a young age that we just go with what we were taught or what we have seen in pop culture, and since there's no place where we're being taught the opposite, it just stays like that, and that keeps happening, and then that impacts the entire world, like Jasmine says, because then these boys who've been watching pornography since they were eight, which is like the majority of children, they grow up to become like these Harvey Weinsteins, and they grow up to think that that's okay. Yeah. I also think that there's kind of, um, porn is like one way that this issue manifests itself, but the larger issue is that we don't talk about what healthy sexuality is. Mm -hmm. And like in my own experience, I find that like the space that I've experienced with Good Cap is what makes me feel confident in, I mean, everything I do in my life, <laughs> but like, she, yeah, I should just say that that's she means. I don't know if they know what that is. Like that's our group. Oh, good. that's our. <laughs> yes. She's like she just means being part of this theater group. Yeah, I I think that I'm lucky and we're lucky because we have spaces where we get to talk about these things and we all talk about sex all the time. And so like personally, I think we would all agree that we get to have healthy conversations about sexuality. But most of my friends are not in this theater group in school, and so they don't get to talk about any of it. And then. How do we break down what we see in porn and what we're taught from our friends and pop culture and TV if we don't ever talk about it? If, if the only messages we're getting are from porn then, and we don't get to speak about it, then it's just going to continue that way. Hi. I worked as an educator for many years, about 25 years, and I taught children abroad in a few countries. And I'm going to talk about something that happened to me in Costa Rica. I was teaching English in a rural school. And in one classroom, I had all six grades from one to six. And one of my students approached me and said that there were four boys lifting her skirt and bothering her. I said, really? Come sit down, tell me what happened, because I'm gonna take care of this right now. I'm gonna nip it in the bud. So I took the four boys, and I put them in the four different corners, facing the wall, big time out, and I had them write an apology letter to her. One of them said that he wasn't gonna write anything. I said, well, you're not leaving today. Anyway, I tackled the issue, and, uh, and they stopped. I came to visit the school uh, for the Christmas party they invited me, and the girl, she was about nine, and she was very happy. She told me that it had stopped, that they don't bother her anymore, and nobody's been bothering her. And I think it's very important to teach children empathy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there is a, there's a window where children need to learn empathy, especially boys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the empathy, especially boys, that they have to respect girls and women. Mm -hmm. And when I have talked to boys that have been disrespectful, I always remind them that a woman gave birth to you. And if you don't learn how to respect girls and women, you're gonna have big problems in life. Yeah. So they need to learn emotional intelligence mm -hmm. and they need to be respectful. So for us, I mean, obviously we couldn't agree more in terms of um, the empathy is really the key. And, I, and, and, and for us, I mean, that's what the Me Too movement is. And honestly, Me Too is where theater lives. Mm -hmm. Like that's what theater is, right, exactly. And that's, 
That's why, um, that's why storytelling is so valuable when we talk about activism, we talk about staying hopeful. It's because we have witnessed and we've traveled this country and brought this play to schools and sat down with big communities of kids of all gender. We've seen the transformation that happens when you witness something living and breathing right in front of you and you have to watch what it must feel like to go through this or you have to hear other, you know, uh, peers of yours, classmates of yours, raise their hand and say, that happened to me. That felt so reflective of my experience. Or you actually see yourself up there and you say, I've been that person. I've done that. I'm the, I've slut shamed someone before. Or I didn't believe someone that when they came forward and said someone did something to them. Or I've been that person that violated someone. Like I know I've done or said weird things or things that were rapey or things that were wrong. And we have to give ourselves the opportunity to identify and be in touch with that. Um, but obviously we couldn't agree more and that's really what Jasmine's talking about is like how do we how do we be how do we become proactive? And in our solution is really introducing people to this issue through art, through something they can con connect to, through something that will stick with them like a story, like a good story does, or like a moving story does, that they think back to, that they really reflect upon, right? And then they have this foundation and basis to have a conversation to really unpack um, all the little things. I mean, bringing up porn, it's like when Joey, when Amalia's character is detailing her rape, can't you hear the porn in that? Can't you hear the like, oh, come on, you know you want to come, you know you're wet now. Like the idea that they keep trying to get her to have an orgasm, which is so interesting because they're actually, which means that in their head, they're like, oh, I'm trying to get this girl to have an orgasm, yet they're not at all really thinking about what would give her pleasure. So they even have a confused idea as to orgasming and actual pleasure, to coming, to them making her come, but her actually experiencing an orgasm, right? Do you see what I'm saying? Like, that's very interesting, I think. So the idea is like, they know to think, oh, like, I, I, we should be like, why isn't she coming? Like, this should be happening, like, whatever, because of all the porn that they watch, because everything they see in movies, like, they know that's supposed to be the finale. But, like, they don't actually think at all about what would feel good for her and how to actually achieve that. And the idea that you would think pinning a girl down and shoving yourself into her would do that, it's what they're seeing in porn, you know? And so, uh, yeah, really... Um, and thank you for doing what you did. I think another thing that you did that's really important that um, is holding people accountable. And that's something we could do a lot more in this culture is hold people accountable. And by simply sitting there and having someone write a letter, you're holding someone accountable, you're asking them to empathize with that situation. I'm, I'm, those kids were lucky to have you. Anybody else? Any students? Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> oh no. I know, but apparently I can't. Hi. Hi. Um, I really enjoyed um, the performance, even though, I mean, I don't know if enjoyed is like the right word oh, to mean? use. Um, my, I guess my question is how, how can we engage men in these conversations because when I look around this room there's like very few men here I right know. and I feel that in a lot of ways all, like women need to have these conversations mm -hmm. but we we often do with maybe in private yeah. but I feel that the people that need to hear this is men yeah. right so yeah. how do we get men to be in the conversation mm -hmm. in that way and I feel that maybe um, the generation coming up like it seems, it seems like maybe there's hope there. Yes, but aren't you that generation? You are. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I I have a, a younger sister. She's in seventh grade. Um, and a boy told her like, oh, you have to go like to this like stupid little dance that they had. And she told him, no, I don't. Yeah, I don't have to go to this dance with right, you. Right. Get out of my face. Right. Like, <laughs> right. Which I felt. I told her, you know, you, that was a little rude, but you know, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> So how, how can we engage men into these conversations? Because I feel like sometimes when you try to engage men in these conversations, yeah. they feel like it's an attack. Yeah. They're like, oh, I'm not like this. Yeah. And I'm like, you probably, you probably have slut shamed at some point. Yeah. And, and they don't see how these very small things yes. mm -hmm. um, are a part of this like larger problem. So how, how do we bring men into the conversation? How do you feel that it's like a way to do that? Yeah. 
Well, you see that by the end. No, no, I was just gonna say, what I keep talking about this is like, I think the best way to do this is to get this type of education into schools because if we're if I if we had a play like Slut or something like Slut come to my school that was mandatory for everyone in the school to come to for like health class or something, and then everybody got to see it, everyone had to hear the talk back, engage in the talk back, at least absorb some part of it. I would hope that you know, not just the like woke kids, like socially aware kids would t get something out of it, but anybody who sees it and has, you know, ears would be able to <laughs> understand Joey's story and take something away. And we always talk about like, after the show, we talk to our guy friends and they're like, I don't feel like a George or a Luke, but maybe I'm a Tim who's the one who just sits and like lets it happen. And I think the play gives us language and it allows us to take ourselves out of the situation directly and talk about it in a more like neutral way. And if we can just have the guys in all of the schools, if we could, you know, New York City have consent of consent education be mandatory and then have everyone come in at least hear it and be like, yeah, and we should add consent education that actually talks about sex. Mm -hmm, right. So like one of the challenges that we have here is like there's a school in the city that uh, one of my students and one of their friends goes to and they had this like the girls like rose up after like the breakout of this Me Too movement where like we need a consent like uh, assembly. They made it mandatory for the whole school except there was a caveat. You weren't allowed to say the word sex or anything sexual. And what's the point? So like, thank you. And so it's like, wait a minute, like this is your response to sexual assault on your high school campus is to say, fine, we'll have a consent. Like assembly, you pull everyone out of school for half the day, but they're not allowed to bring up the word sex or any sexual situations. It's just like a waste. So when these guys keep saying it needs to be in schools, it needs to happen in schools, that actually requires the adults in those schools to get over themselves, <laughs> right? Like it requires, this is why high school girls are invisible in the Me Too moment is because we are uncomfortable with talking about teen female sexuality. And um, it's, we've never been comfortable with that. So we can talk about boys coming into there, like they've got hormones are raging and they're all like, they gotta jerk off all the time. Like, right, like we talk about like boys can't control their, that's why you guys can't wear tank tops because they can't control it, you know, it's like all that's going on. But we never talk about the fact that girls are coming into their sexuality too. And like they're exploring and they have hormones and they have desire. And so the idea that like one of the reasons girls are left out of this is because we are so deeply uncomfortable with the idea of a sexual, a, a, a sexual teen with agency. Mm -hmm. Not a sexualized teen, a sexual teen, right? And so, um, so we, we totally agree with you. And it, so I wanna add that one of the things that we as a, as a theater group are doing, so after touring with Slut, after touring with this play for about three years, I realized exactly what you were saying. Like, except for the schools where we were bringing it where it's mandatory, so many times, like, the audience would be packed with girls and women. I'm just like, ah, oh, we could have this conversation till we're blue in the face. Like, I gotta get some guys in this audience. And then, so I was like, would go to these schools and go to these, and the guy, I would say to the guys in the audience, like, what can I do to, like, get more guys in the audience? They're like, could you do a play about guys? And I was like, um, yes, I can. And so, <laughs> so that's what I did. So I, got together a group of high school guys in the city and spent three months developing a play about rape culture and porn and in sexuality through the lens of high school boys. And so now we've been touring that and that is, it does exactly what you say we need, which is all of a sudden it's like, oh, I don't have to be defensive. Because it, it's, the play is about the fact that like these guys are, that everyone, every, everyone of every gender is a product of this culture. Does that make sense? And like there are things that they are going through that they deserve, that they deserve to be addressed. Does that make sense? And it deserve to be acknowledged. And, um, and I think there's something that happens for all of us when we feel like we see ourselves represented, right? And so I think the way that we sort of um, bring men into the conversation is invite them. Um, and, and to, to welcome them and to say, like, listen, there are a lot of gender expectations happening across the spectrum here, and it creates, it's creating a combustible situation, and, like, we need to figure this out. I was at this high school in Boston, and I'm working with these, you know, 500 kids, and, like, you ask, it's like, there's not one kid in that audience that wants to rape somebody. Not wants to. 
Does that make sense? Like, no one's sitting there being like, shit, I can't wait for Friday and I can't wait to rape somebody. Do you know what I'm saying? They really are not saying that. They want, they don't know how to engage effectively because we are not giving them the tools, tools to. So you're right, they're essential to the conversation and I think we're trying to do our part to welcome them in and bring them in and, and, and create a, a piece of art that reflects their experience too so we can crack that conversation open also. What's the piece? <laughs> oh, I should have said that. So the name of the play is Now That We're Men. And I would have had that be a part of this, but this is really about phenomenal women. And so I decided... Save that for later. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes. How about the parents? How do the parents get involved in this, starting even at an earlier age, especially with young boys? How, what is their role, or what can you do to include more mm. family and parenting skills? Mm related to all of this. Um, do, you, do any of you want to jump in? I don't want to talk. No. Well, um, <laughs> we talk about this like all the time, but if we could just, on the playground, when the kids are four, stop telling girls that when a boy is mean to them and comes up to them and tries to get you to hug them or kiss them or whatever it is, and the girl says no, the boy has to listen. <laughs> but sometimes they need to be taught. Who, parents? Yes. Yeah, mm. I know. Yes. They really As do. Well. Yeah. It's right. not that they wouldn't say that, but <laughs> yeah, they, they don't really know. Yeah. The direction. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. I, you know, I think parents are really tough. Yeah. I, I, I think, I, I, um, I want to say like get educated, but you're like, how do I, how do we do that? I, I, I don't, I don't know. I think it's about, honestly, I think it's ripple effect. I, I would say to parents, like, if you could listen to your kids with empathy, when your kids come and say to you, this stuff is happening, believe them. Don't try to talk them out of it. Like, lean into that conversation, believe them, and have empathy for that, and try to figure out how you as the adult can step in and help. Does that make sense? But I get what you're saying, that it's like, that. how do we do that until that lesson is taught? Well, that's why, I mean, I keep going back to this, and I'm not just going back to it because it's what I do, but I will say that I do think art is a big player here. I, I do. I think there's something that is really important when you can go to a museum or go to a movie theater or go to a theater and see something cultural, see something that, is, that isn't a lecture, that, that like is basically preaching to the choir, right? That's something that would maybe pull in audiences that wouldn't normally attend. So what's really cool when we go across the country to these different schools, um, the schools that make it mandatory for students also open it up to parents. So what happens is when they open it up to parents, we've got all the kids down in the orchestra, we've got a ton of parents up in the balcony, and they're just as horrified as their kids are. And then what happens after is we get to have an hour-long conversation with parents and kids together where the parents then get to hear kids from their school tell their own experiences with this or ask certain questions or say, I wish my parents this, that, and whatever, right? Parents get to ask questions. How can I best support my kids? What can I do? Shouldn't we be concerned about how girls dress in school? Like, right, like we just are not doing enough, those of us who are the leaders. I think we need to maybe do a bit more to create more spaces where we try to get everybody there, not just the academic community not just the feminist community, right? Not just the anti-rape activists, which we should all be, but you know what I mean. It's like, how do we, how do, we do that? And to me, it's just, it's all art all the time because that's the thing that's like a, that people can latch onto, you know? Um, that would be my answer because I, I, I hear you because I don't know how to get someone to buy a book that they're not inclined to buy, right? Exactly, I don't know, I don't know how to do it. We could like hold our media like to a higher standard. We could say like, um, you know, ask them to do better representations of what this actually looks like in the lives of kids instead of romanticizing it or pornifying it or whatever. But again, that takes knowledge too. I don't know, this Me Too thing is helping as people are talking about it. So, yeah, thank you. It's a great question. I, I just want to say that I hate that word consent. You know, uh, you don't consent, you cannot, there is no consent to a rape or an assault. But, and right. the, just the word consent, just thinking mm -hmm. about it, it's like, uh, 
Well, yeah, you know, uh, with their with the implied threat, mm. uh, you you know, you consented to have your house burglarized, or I mean, just the word consent when you think about it. Yeah. Well, she consented, you know, or I broke her down, or, or yeah. I just hate that word. Yeah. Completely consent. I, I think they should stop using it, mm. and and there should be other vocabulary. Uh, that's my opinion. I I think it's. I think the issue might not lie in the word itself, and more just in the fact that like people don't really understand what it should be or what it is. Um, I think that a lot of the time, or at least in the places that I've spoken about this issue, we've like changed it to like affirmative consent, and that kind of adds more like specific like specificity to it. Um, but I still think that the idea is kind of convoluted, and I I do think that there's issues surrounding like the idea of like coercing someone and that being consent or not and there's also there's like a lot of different things that come into play where people aren't entirely sure on what it is yeah. um, but i think that it's important to have a word that kind of defines that and because then you can see when it's not there it's so like if you know when there's consent you know when there's not consent and i just think that we need to like kind of define define the word a little bit more clearly and at least like spread that around because i feel very confident in what consent is and the fact that it has to be freely given and there can't be any other like factors but I don't think that that's like the recognized definition um, so I think that the issue might not be the word but just like more all the different like impressions that people have of it huh okay. but it but it but it's consenting not to rape though it's consenting to sex mm -hmm. no, the, the reason I even started thinking about that is that I went to hear this very well-known like French I think one of the things that's very challenging that's been brought up here um, is that uh, sexuality is is not so black and white. Mm -hmm. Se sexuality is really gray, mm -hmm. and it's dynamic, mm -hmm. right? It's moment to moment. You can say, yeah, I want to make out with you, and I think I want to do other things, and then, oh, maybe not, yeah. maybe not, right? Yeah. Um, and, and that kind of ebb of, and flow of desire and pleasure, which, as you have said, we are not talking about. We are so uncomfortable yeah recognizing, and that is also part of this larger conversation, which then is something for guys to think about, about girls' pleasure and desire, for girls to think about, about their pleasure and desire, and for everybody to think about girls' and women's entitlement to yes. their own feelings. And that, I think, can shift uh, some of the questions that we're asking yeah. about that word and about the interactions that happen around that word. We also had a, did you still have a question up there? Oh. No, wait. They do, hold on one sec, she's running up to you. <laughs> we can't totally hear you. No, we don't, why? You. And then I have to run back down to her. <laughs> Should we have shot? What I wanted to say is parents really do need to be educated. That's yeah. part of the problem. Yeah. And unfortunately, the parents that need, well, I wouldn't say the most education, but it seems like they control certain things that they teach their sons are the boys mothers. When they expect a girl to be responsible for her sons or any boy, uh, other boys' uh, sexual feelings, and she can only be responsible for her own. Not his, you know, and she has feelings too. And it has to be brought out of the closet, so to speak, that girls do want sex yeah. and have yeah. sex. Because yeah. growing up, all I ever hear is nice girls yes. don't want sex, only the bad yes. ones. Mm -hmm. And then the boy only wants to have sex with the bad girl, right. not the girl he cares right. about, which is totally ridiculous. It's and totally I could go ridiculous. on. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Not even a question, well, just a so. comment. I loved it. It was a really passionate one. <laughs> I agree. I agree completely. Um, well, my question is, what do you say when uh, the argument of, oh, but pornography is also an art, and um, so on and so forth. So, like, I know that, like, pornography is, like, um, America's number one export or something like that. What, <laughs> what do you say to that, you know? You say that's so sad, but, um, <laughs> I no. I hear what you're saying. Um, 
Uh, okay. I'm going to say, oh, you have an idea? Okay. This is becoming a whole dialogue now. I feel like pornography is created with the idea that the viewer is going to be male. Yes. And because That's of that, it ties a lot of connotations that make it um, objectify women. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. But what if the viewer is one, um, a woman? Yeah. Then it allows women to be sexual, mm -hmm. and it doesn't create them mm -hmm. in this objectified mm -hmm. nature. Well, yeah. And I think that w one of the things that we could talk about is 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 the difference or like the nuance difference or uh, between pornography and erotica, right? So it's like I was just listening to this podcast about romance novels and like the like amazing, hot, uh, incredible sex that women are writing predominantly and also the LGBTQIA community and like, right? And there's like a whole, it's, it's, it's a pretty much like, um, it's pretty much dominated by people who are not, straight men. Does that make sense? And so that, that field of, of um, romance novels. And they were, and, and, and people were just talking about why, why women gobble them up. They're like, you know, they, they sell like hotcakes. And one of the reasons is because they see themselves, right? It's like a woman writing for women about sex, or it's gay men writing for gay men about the sex that they want to have, right? Or it's trans, right? Do you see what I'm saying? And um, we don't have that in porn. I think that that's exactly right. So in order for me to really think of porn as an art form, it's got to expand. I don't think I'm ever going to get there. I got to be really honest with you, but that's okay. Everyone can have their thing. I don't think I'm ever going to get there. But I, I think it's really about what you're saying, is that we actually don't have anything that reflects all of us, right? It's pre predominantly male-produced, male-directed for the male gaze. And so that's why a lot of us feel left out. And you know? sorry, can I just add, it's a replacement for sex ed. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's our main objection. Yeah. Or yeah. What, as, us as educators. It, yeah, it's a replacement for sex ed, like, in culture. It's, like, not like anyone's saying, oh, like, go watch this. But, like, that's what you do when you're trying to learn out what to learn, learn what to do when, when it comes to sex, right? So it's, like, everyone's, like, oh, shh. He's going to expect me to do whatever. I better... Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> better go look it up. <laughs> Watch it. Hi. I, uh, I agree with you that most of the sex, that the, most of the pornography that's created mm -hmm. is mostly aimed towards the male gaze. Yeah. But there are a lot of women who are now starting to... Yes. Mm -hmm. But, you know... Uh, Male. It's harder to find. It's niche. It's harder to find. Um, no, not not you anymore. Don't think so? Not anymore. No, okay. it's it's easier to find. But this is the case with a lot of uh, different, you know, environments. It's not just oh god, with of course, porn. even of course. with TV. Most of the oh god, the totally stuff on TV with is, just mainstream media. I was just yeah, saying exactly. to I was just, just saying all to of Charlotte, it. Just yeah, all of it. yeah. I was just saying to Charlotte, yeah. we were like having coffee before, and I was just saying to her, I was reading this script, this film script, and I was just like. <sighs> And it was like, there's a sex scene in it. And it was like, I'm reading it. And I'm like, was this written by a guy? And I flipped to the front because it's like the way he was describing what this female actress would be doing in this sex scene was totally like not anything a woman would write. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, yeah. So I definitely understand where the argument go yeah. goes against like porn yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. But there are a lot of women who are trying to change that. Yeah, there are such great. thing as feminist porn, which I is agree. what they're calling it, yeah. um, where it's mostly aim towards women so I that agree. women um but I do agree that um a lot because we don't have sex ed in school as well as we should have it yeah um a lot of men and women use um porn as yeah. education which it yeah, isn't yeah and really boys and girls is yeah. the problem mainly it's yeah. the, the men and women thing yeah but it's yeah. the boys and girls that concern yeah. me even more yeah. yeah so um it's it's mostly about like how you guys have been saying that it's just education in, you know, having the education. Because also porn is just kind of like a little bit fetishy. So it's, it's, that's what it is. It's about, you know, once you or have already developed your sense of yes. what your yes. sexuality is. And it's very aggressive. And that's yeah. like also very important for us to say is that what, what's, you know, there was a study out of the University of Alabama and the study was that of the top porn links, like the top porn, online porn videos, 80% um, of them um, showed um, acts of aggression. And out of those 80%, 98% of the 80% were acts of aggression against women. So, yeah. Yeah, hi. Um, oh. Oh. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, 
so with a title like slut, have you had, and like with the content being so sensitive, have you had schools tell you no, that they don't want you coming to their school because they think that it's too, especially when it's mandatory? Yeah. Um, yes. Yes. But um, you know what's really interesting is that more often than not, um, the reason why people are nervous about having the play in the school oh, is because of, yes, the title, which is, by the way, a word. It's a very loaded word. I understand that, but it's a word, right? And it's a word that has to actually be a part of the conversation. And by the way, it's not like it's a word that none of these students know, right? Like they know it. They've been using it since like third grade, right? Um, I will say that. It's not like, by the way, a word that these teachers aren't thinking every time one of their female students walks by in a t-shirt that like slightly reveals their midriff, right? Um, I will also say that one of the reasons isn't actually the content. It will also be because there is vulgarity. And so what always is fascinating to me is when someone is like, yeah, um, I'm just concerned. There's just, you say fuck in this play. Um, eek, you know, and I'm like, right, so you're, you're calling me about the word fuck, and like, you're, you're, you're upset about the word fuck when I basically just, you, you're, you're, you want to address rape culture in your school, and you want me to censor how you, how we do that? How is that productive? And the funny thing is, what I hear from high school students, what we hear from high school students across the country, no matter where we go, if we're in Fargo, North Dakota, Phoenix, Arizona, or here in New York City, is that it is authentic that it sounds, like it, it sounds like their world, it sounds like the kids they know, that's how kids talk in the hallway, and the language is a part of it, it is. And so yeah, we do get pushback. Um, it's going, it's eroding, I feel like, that pushback. I feel like we're getting into, once certain schools took a chance on us, um, more schools opened their doors, and what's been really amazing, it's actually been student advocates that have been the reason why we've been in the majority of schools that we've been in. It's like one 17-year-old girl that's like, damn it, you're doing this play, and my mom is calling, and we're doing this play, you know what I mean? There's something really great about when a group of young people get together and like decide to make it happen. But yeah, it's, it's a problem, but it's okay. We're, we're, I would never change it, the, the title, ever. Um, it's a good question. Um, you brought up about dress codes. Does the play talk about that at all? Because you're constantly reading, you know, it's the emphasis is on the girl in school, the young women, to cover up and that it's somehow their fault. You know, does it go into that? Or have these young ladies experienced that at their schools? Um, well, luckily at my school, at LaGuardia, we do not have a dress code. Um, we dress however we want, and that's kind of great, and I feel really lucky, but even though I don't get, um, even though I don't get, like, detention or in trouble for dressing however I want, there's still this, like, uncomfortableness and censorship of women's bodies and the things that we're allowed to say versus things that guys are allowed to say and things that, um, guys are allowed to get away with and girls can't get away with. So I think um, dress code, the dress code problem at least for me with the idea of getting punished for what you're wearing isn't um, as bad as it used to be. And I think that's really great. Um, but it's still, it's still that inequality that shows up in other ways um, that comes up a lot more in this play. Today, a friend of mine was wearing a tank top, and the principal, we don't have a dress code either, and the principal of my school came up to her and was like, if this is what you're wearing now, I can't imagine what you're going to wear when it's summertime. <laughs> Which is fucking crazy. <laughs> because, first of all, she was staring at, well, it's just crazy. Yeah. I, like, I can't even list out the reasons why it's crazy, but... Like, the principal of my school sought out one of her students to shame her and make her feel uncomfortable about her body and point out what my friend knew when she looked in the mirror, which is what she looked like. And my friend decided she liked that and wanted to go to school like that. And then the principal of, like, an academic institution took it upon herself to, like, single out one student 
out of her like busy day as a principal of a public school in New York City. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. Like, why don't we talk about the fact that like your school is segregated and you need to fucking fix it? <laughs> Instead, she's going to my friend and being like, your tits are out. Like, come on, it's crazy. Yeah, crazy. Oh yeah, it, it, there's no, it, it, there's no discrimination with who's policing the bodies. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's interesting because my school also doesn't have a dress code. Yeah. Um, but there have well, been like mm. you go to New York City Public High School. Yeah, 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 you yeah, do yeah. have a dress code. It's just the way that your particular school is enforcing, enforcing. or not. Oh right. no, yes. my school actually like there's nothing that well, I. Use. There is a handbook. You have yeah, the. You, is, are you a New York City Public School student? I have yeah. a handbook. You get a public school. It's oh, just part okay. of the DOE oh, thing. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So like, I guess we don't enforce a dress code in my school, but there still have been many incidents where me or my friends, like teachers, will come to us and be like. Oh, you're really okay. I see what you're wearing, and it's like, okay, you can't comment on that. Like, that has nothing to do with school. And so it's like the fact that like maybe there aren't like concrete rules that like you'll get in trouble for, which I know there are at other schools. Um, but like people are still policing us constantly, and they're still talking to us about it, and it still somehow has to do with our education, even though it definitely doesn't. So yeah. Well, there there are girls in our cast that have to wear shame suits. So like when you violate the dress code, you have to put on like basically an orange jumpsuit like you're basically in prison. And so like you put on this oversized outfit to embarrass yourself or at some of the other schools, public or private, doesn't matter, you have to put on um, stuff from the lost and found. So you have to like dig through the lost and found bin to find appropriate clothing to cover your shoulders or your bra strap, your midriff, whatever. Um, and so like that's also super humiliating because you have to like dig through the used clothes. Um, and then also the other big thing that we're seeing a lot is, um, um, I'm like, mm, um, is, is like nipple policing. Yeah. Um, and so, which I find really horrifying is the idea of like teachers pulling students aside and being like, are you not wearing a bra? And the girl being like, uh, nope. And they're like, well, I can see everything. And I'm like, and what she means is like, what you mean, my nipple? <laughs> like, meaning not. She's not. I'm not talking about like, by the way, in a sheer shirt, which, you know, I'm not even gonna. I, we have to like crack all that open. How I feel about that because I feel like that would be totally also fine. But um, but but I mean, she means like just the like just the nipple. Like you can see the shape of the nipple through the shirt, and the teacher finds that offensive and distracting. And I just want to add, when we talk about dress code, if we want to sit and have a conversation about like Louis C.K.'s and Harvey Weinstein's and Bill Cousins, like we like make a list of all these guys or like the heads of companies or whatever that are like dropping like flies, be, you know, when we sit there and we say, to, we say to ourselves, well, why didn't these women feel confident? Like, why would you go up to that hotel room? Why would these, right, okay, exactly. Yes, you're making my point, I love it. Yes, exactly. You, why would these women go to this hotel room? Why would these women stay in this meeting? Why would they do all these things? Why do they make these choices? Well, you know what? If from the time you are an 11, 12-year-old girl when the body policing really, really starts, right? If from that time, some person of authority says to you, I need to talk to you. I need to talk to you. Come in here, please. And they start like addressing your body like, how do we think that we're preparing people to say no to other people that have authority later on in life? Like, we're not. And so, um, I know dress code is a hot top, is a tr uh, very sensitive topic, but um, I'm glad that someone brought it up. Um, yes. I wanted to know what the youngest audience is that you have um, shown this play to, uh -huh. and what you think is the optimal, appropriate age to show it to. Mm -hmm. um, the youngest audience, I guess like for a school, like for a school group, the youngest group we've ever had is a group of seventh graders um, that have come see this play. And those of you, do you, a lot of you have kids? Some of you were kids not that long ago. I don't know if any of you have kids, but um, I don't think you'd probably be that surprised to know that it wasn't that shocking for a group of seventh graders. So what's really interesting is like if you think about the fact, like if you think about who's playing Grand Theft Auto, yeah. where you basically like pick up a, a woman who's being prostituted off the street and you like put her in your car and then like after she pleasures you, you like pay her, but then like you stop the car and you get out and you like kill her and then you like keep the money, you know what I'm saying, to get your money back. Like if we can realize that like fourth, fifth, and sixth graders are playing Grand Theft Auto, then like I don't think they're that shocked by like A, the word fuck, or B, this play. So um, there's also that element. So I think that most people find that kids aren't that shocked. I would also say like we work with middle schoolers. These kids are having like truth or dare parties where they're being dared to like go and do stuff with each other in closets, you know what I mean? And so it's like that, that look, by the way, 
horrifically similar to what it happens in this play. I would also say that like one of the most interesting things that um, I read in the news last year was an issue at Baruch Middle School in the city where a eighth grade boy, um, which is just not that much older than seventh grade, like an eighth grade boy had um, asked this girl that liked him, like um, if he wanted to, she wanted to like go on a walk, like because they have out lunch, right? And so they went to out lunch. Um, he asked her to do stuff to him in the park. She did without knowing because she couldn't see because she was on her knees. Um, he filmed it, then blackmailed her and said he would send it to her parents and everyone in the school if she didn't meet him at that point every day in the park to do this to her. So this needs to happen as early, I would argue, as sixth and seventh grade. And if we need adults to be there to help, help them process this after, of course, of course. But I've never met a seventh grader that has said to me after seeing this play, that felt really foreign to me, right? And um, with now that we're men, <laughs> right, with now that we're men, we had um, actually had, at the time, a 10-year-old that came to see the play. And I remember, like, it was one of the early performances of Now That We're Men. He came to see the play. He was, like, sitting, like, right there. And, they're, like, and I'm like, wow, okay. Um, it's just, like, explicit, but his mom's here, so I guess she's aware of what's going to happen. And so after, and I'm looking at him the whole play, and I'm like, oh, this kid, oh, my God, I've, like, da damaged this kid, you know? And um, at the end, like, we're all sitting there, and he raises his hand. He's the first question in the talk back is this kid, this 10-year-old kid. He raises his hand. He's like, um, yeah, hi. I just want to say that was very relatable. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes. You know what I mean? Yikes. And then it was like, oh, well, what do you mean? Then I talked to him after. And, and now that we're man, I didn't get to sh share any of it with you today, but it, it addresses a lot of the sim similar things, very differently, but similar. And he came up to me and he was like, you know, I just wanted to tell you that it was so relatable to me because people touch everyone's bodies all the time without asking. And like, my friends send me weird porn links all the time. And if I don't watch it, they call me a faggot. So, you know, mm -hmm. right? And it's like, we have to talk about that. We have to talk about what the standards of, like, what these gender expectations are. Does that make sense? And so I would get like as young as possible. But I mean, I think 10 is probably a stretch. So I'd say seventh grade, seventh grade. So I'm going to um, give myself the last question. And um, I'd like to ask the actors if you can tell us uh, what it was like for you, what it is like for you to be in this play and to do these roles. Um, well, I love doing this play like more than anything. I mean, in like at my school, um, in my classes, I'm known as that like, that crazy feminist girl, and like that's my favorite thing in the whole entire world. <laughs> like I don't care. Like I'm like I, I feel so lucky that I've gotten to have these conversations, and as I'm coming to into my own sexuality, be able to connect to um, my peers um, who are also in this play, their sexuality and these characters' sexuality and share the stories of people who can't share their stories. And I think since you can sit and you can look at statistics all day, you can read a book, but nothing will tug at your heartstrings like watching someone go through something and the fact that like um, me and my friends get to be those initiators of change is really great. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a lot of similar feelings about this play. Um, I mean, I've been doing class with this theater company since like sixth grade, so I like was kind of me going through puberty was me having this like community to talk about it with, and that was like the most important thing for me. And I think the reason why I'm like a confident like person who's able to articulate her feelings and feels like comfortable with her body and feels comfortable like sticking up for herself, and I like attribute a lot of that to like having a place to talk about it. Um, I'm a little choked up right now, I'm sorry about that. Um, this play like actually helped me through a lot of stuff um, because I had a similar experience and I was kind of able to talk about it because I had these, this community and because I knew there were people willing to listen because I performed it and I tell people about this all the time. So like when I went through something very similar, I knew that I would be able to get through it because I have met so many incredible people throughout this experience and 
I think that's like a, a big reason why I'm able to like go through the stuff that I went through. Um, and because of that, that kind of made it even more important that I'm doing what I'm doing because I know how it feels to be supported by this play. Like I know how it feels to hear what people are saying, to like watch this play and to feel comforted by that and to feel like there are people who understand. So it kind of was this really interesting experience for me where I was feeling supported by the play as well as I felt like I was supporting others, which is like such a good feeling. So this play means a lot to me. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> I just, I just wish that everyone could, if I could, explain this feeling of this like camaraderie. I can't explain it. I couldn't. I'm like, I'm sorry. But I wish that everyone had a space like this because, in on my smaller level things, I feel like if I didn't have this space, I would be so much worse off. I just, I, I'm having such a hard time articulating it, but like Nakia said, like I wouldn't be as confident in my personality, in my ability to like speak freely about what I believe in my body, in my convictions, in any, anything if I wasn't in this play. And, and I can't imagine how I would be dealing with all the shit that gets thrown at us if I didn't have this. And like the only thing I could say is that all I want for anybody else is that girls my age and boys my age get to experience a space like this or see a play like this or whatever it is and like understand this feeling I like Nikita put it. I don't know. <laughs> Hello. Can I just say one thing before we finish? Um, I just want to say one thing. I have to because I think you saw only a snippet and you might enjoy the entire play. And so I, I think um, we are doing both Slut and Now That We're Men, um, April 27th, 28th, and 29th at um, the Green Space in association with WNYC. So you will you could see the whole thing and you could see the entire their cast in its entirety and you could see the the you could see Now That We're Men also. And that might be an interesting thing because that's been a big part of this conversation. Um, and I also want to say that in the days leading up to now that we're men, something really cool that's happening is the first all girl of color cast of Slut is performing the play in Newark, New Jersey. And that's been really exciting for me. I've been working with this incredible group of girls. Um, the play got an entire rewrite because I wanted to make it feel authentic and true to these incredibly courageous girls. So it digs into issues of race and religion and friendship in a way um, that is that is so similar, of course, to the original script, but also really different and, 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 and really important for us to all take in and see. So that will be at the um, New Jersey Performing Arts Center on April 25th, 26th, and 27th. So right across the river, two groups of girls taking on this issue. It's pretty badass, in my opinion. So anyway, I just wanted you to know. Um, all right, I hope we see you there. Thank you. Uh, I cannot thank uh, Katie and Nikita and Jasmine and Amalia enough for this spectacular event, for coming and showing us and telling us and listening to us and speaking with us about an unspeakable uh, issue uh, emb embodied so well by the word slut. And we thank you immensely for that. I also want to very quickly thank um, Roosevelt House, which has been phenomenal in uh, helping us pull this together, really pulling it together. Um, Har Harold Holzer, the director of Roosevelt House, has been incredibly supportive. And I also want to give a shout out to Rafael Munoz, who has done everything. Thank you so much. And Danny, thanks for the tech. Um, Next, uh, the next event in Phenomenal Women at Roosevelt House is going to be held on April 11th, which is not long after spring break. It's the Tuesday after spring break. If you look on the back of your programs, it is called Girls Doing Activism. It is a panel of four young women who uh, do very different kinds of activism, who are coming to talk to us about what they do, what it's like, why they do it, how they do it. 
um, and what their passions are about so that we can talk to them about what our passions might be about too and how we can um, connect with the kinds of things that they are doing. And you can uh, sign up for that outside uh, on your way out. I believe there's still some something to eat, is there? Yes, uh, please on your way uh, out, do stop and um, get a bite to eat. And uh, we're thrilled that you came, thank you so much.